Hi, I'm Matt Needham, and this is my lecture on special refrigeration components. Now, before we get involved into these extra components, these other 19 items besides the four basic ones we have, let's quickly review the refrigeration cycle so you can keep it in your mind as we add all of these other items to it. Coming off of the metering device, the thermostatic expansion valve, we have a cold, low pressure, low temperature refrigerant with a little bit of vapor. And as it travels through the evaporator, it picks up the heat from whatever we're trying to cool down and it turns 100% into vapor. That last little bit of the evaporator, we add superheat, the number of degrees above the boiling point. So if this was turning more and more into a vapor at 40 degrees and we measure 50 degrees at the outlet, of the evaporator, it could be said that we have 10 degrees of superheat. Then the compressor sucks this superheated vapor from the suction line, and even though it's called superheated vapor, this line is relatively cold in compared to the ambient that would be around it. And it squeezes into a smaller pipe, the discharge line, and those molecules are compressed together, and the pressure and the temperature go up and this is a high pressure, high temperature, it's, that's hot, vapor. As it heads down the discharge line, it desuperheats and it desuperheats as it enters the condenser and then in the middle part of the condenser, it condenses into a liquid. We're getting rid of the heat that we picked up and we're dumping it where we don't care about, let's say in this instance outside. And at the end of the condenser, once it becomes 100% liquid, as we cool it down more, we add subcooling, which is the number of degrees below the condensing temperature. So if it's turning more and more to a liquid, 120 degrees, and we measure 100 degrees on the liquid line, it's said that we have 20 degrees of subcooling. And then it comes back to the metering device where it's metered down or it goes through a small opening. You've already gotten rid of the heat. When you drop the pressure, you drop the boiling point and a little bit of that liquid refrigerant turns itself into vapor and the whole compound gets cold. The thermostatic expansion valve, the type of metering device we have here, regulates superheat to maintain about 8 to 12 degrees of superheat at the outlet of our evaporator. Now let's remove this and reveal the bigger diagram beneath it now that you... And remember, even though you're looking at all these extra components now, the cycle is still the same. It's just how do these um, things act upon it, okay? So here again, you've got, we're gonna take a couple laps around here and add more as we go. Let's kind of do a basic thing and just ID a few of the items as we make our first lap around this cycle. As you're coming out of the metering device, the thermostatic expansion valve, you see the D here for distributor. And you'll see two or three pipes here, could be more, on some systems, which distribute the refrigerant evenly, hence the term distributor, to the evaporator, cutting down on just the pressure drop that you'd have from the friction of the piping, allowing the metering device to be the main driver of the metering of the refrigerant and the pressure drop to the evaporator. And again, it boils off and you get superheated vapor on your um, suction line. And then we come to our CPR valve, which you'll find in refrigeration systems, but not air conditioning systems, the crankcase pressure regulating valve. And this limits the amount of flow going to the compressor during a hot pull down, or if you have a very abnormally high heat load, like when you first start up a freezer or when it's coming out of defrost. And then you come here on the suction line to the accumulator, and this is basically just a big pot or cylinder that can catch any bits of liquid refrigerant that happen to get in the suction line um, and give it a chance to boil off. And then the compressor um, compresses the vapor, gives it an honorable discharge out the discharge line. We have a vibration eliminator, which is like a copper braided type of hose that helps with the vibration um, of the copper without cracking the discharge line. And then you come to your oil separator, and this basically takes the minuscule amounts of oil out of 
the piping and puts it back into the compressor so that it doesn't have to go through the entire system. And then we head over to our condenser where we're going to condense the refrigerant and add subcooling and then head down the liquid line to R, which is the receiver. Receiver is a big vessel that can hold all of the refrigerant in your system. And you have a valve on the outside called the king valve that um, you could front seat in order to pump the system down manually um, and store all the refrigerant if you wanted in the receiver and the condenser to make a repair here. Okay. Um, and then here we have the purple, which is the liquid line filter dryer that helps take out any moisture water droplets, the tiny ones that could be in the system um, or any kind of particulates that could get into your metering device and plug it up like little tiny grains of, of copper or dirt. And we have a sight glass here where we can look at the quality of the refrigerant. And then a liquid line solenoid valve that again is only used in refrigeration so that we can do an automatic pump down, put the refrigerant on the high side, isolate it from the low side so the refrigerant's not migrating or moving around the system when we're, the compressor is off. Then we come over again to the thermostatic expansion valve and the thermostatic expansion valve drops the pressure and drops the temperature. Again, it turns some of itself into vapor because you're getting 100% liquid from the liquid line and the whole compound gets very cold, okay? The opening force for your thermostatic expansion valve is the sensing bulb. And it has refrigerant in there, a combination of liquid and vapor. And the warmer the suction line gets, the more that liquid refrigerant boils off and opens the diaphragm. This is opposed by low side pressure plus spring tension. So you always have these acting, opening and closing and metering automatically to maintain around eight to 12 degrees of superheat at the outlet of your evaporator. Again, the last little bit of the evaporator, once it becomes 100% vapor, you add superheat or the number of degrees above the boiling point. And then you head here to your CPR valve and you can actually hook up your gauge on the CPR valve um, here where uh, you have it and see what the pressure is in your evaporator and then compare it to what pressure you have coming out of it entering your compressor in the crankcase. And this is to deal with a hot pull down because when you first start up, let's say a freezer, for instance, the freezer in the box is a walk-in freezer. It might be 75 degrees. The unit never ran, right? When it's designed to maintain zero degrees, it gets as warm as zero plus one degrees. It's too warm. We cool it down to negative three, negative four degrees, okay? So by being 75 degrees above the temperature, all that thermal mass refrigerant flow can cause the compressor to overload, to overload. And so we have this adjustment here. We put an Allen wrench or hex head key in to the CPR valve and put a clamp on ammeter on the compressor. And we can adjust this so that we don't exceed the full load amps during the hot pull down. Now it's not just when we start up the box, although that's a factor. Every time, if it's a freezer system that we come out of defrost because we put electric heat on the evaporator or shot hot gas into the evaporator to get rid of the accumulation of the ice that's built up since it's a freezer. The evaporator is warm and that extra heat load can overload the compressor. So this cuts, this sets the maximum, the CPR valve sets the maximum pressure that can be on the suction line. And by setting the maximum pressure, it's also setting the maximum flow rate. The more refrigerant that passes through the compressor, the more work it does, the higher the amperage. And then um, this might say, let's say, set a pressure maximum of 50. So you could have 50 PSIG here, and you might have 80 here when it first starts up and comes out of defrost. But then as everything cools down, then this gets down to 50 and 50, and this isn't really a factor anymore, and then the pressure will head down to 45, 40, and lower, and so forth. Uh, I'm just using those numbers as an example off of your CPR valve. Now, 
um, you come over again here to your accumulator and sometimes because of defrost and all these actions going on, we could get some liquid coming back and it temporarily gives it this vessel where that liquid can sit at the bottom and then boil off so that we're not getting liquid in the compressor. We also have here a crankcase heater, which this is the only component in the whole thing that would be exclusively an air conditioning component, but it is in the chapter. And the reason for that is that in air conditioning, when the compressor's not running and the compressor's sitting outside, let's say, and let's say you had a split system and the evaporator is in an attic in the winter time, um, the evaporator is going to be a lot warmer than the compressor. So the refrigerant may have a tendency to migrate to the compressor and deposit into the oil. And now you've mixed a mixture of oil and liquid refrigerant. And you're going to start it up and try and lubricate it with that. Not good for the compressor. So that when the compressor doesn't run, the crankcase heater is on in air conditioning. Sometimes some systems, um, some manufacturer designs. Um, and this keeps the oil warm and keeps the refrigerant out of the oil. Um, so that's the uh, red crankcase heater. Again, it's going to be a high resistance, certainly over a thousand ohms. Okay. We also have a sight glass here, which you typically have on larger compressors. I don't think you're going to see a sight glass on a five ton compressor or smaller, but the bigger ones you will, and you can see the oil level in the sight glass. And you can also see the color of it. And they usually also have a valve to drip some oil out to take an oil sample for an acid test or to drain out all the oil to do an oil change on it, which may have to be done on a bigger compressor, particularly if you had a burnout before, an electrical failure on the former compressor. Um, we have our service valves here, the dis suction service valve, discharge service valve, which you have to have on... Um, you have to have service valves on systems that hold more than 6.6 .6 pounds of refrigerant, according to the code. Smaller systems, a lot of times they just have little Schraders where you can just attach your gauges, but you're not able to always isolate everything. Now, we avoid the terms open and closed. We use mid seat, front seat, and back seat. If a service valve is back seated, which this one would be normally in this position, what that means is that it's back seated and you have flow from the suction line into the compressor, but you take the cap off your service port and you're not going to get any refrigerant leaking out of there. If you hook up your hose and then you crack it off the back seat, then you would have all three connected and that the suction line would still feed into the compressor. And then you would be able to get a low side pressure or add refrigerant um, here on your service port. If you front seat or drive the stem in all the way, now you're blocking off the suction line, but the port where you have your hose hooked up is common now to your compressor. And the same thing is identical on your discharge service valve, okay? And then again, um, we come out to the vibration eliminator and to the oil separator. Now the oil separator, again, circulating around the system we have refrigerant, but we also tend to get minuscule amounts of oil out of all compressors and they circulate around and then tiny droplets will come back in and drop into the compressor. But then as we compress it, it gets out again a little bit of like mist almost you could think of. Now, especially when we have really long piping runs in refrigeration, we don't want to have that oil to travel all that way. Think of a supermarket with 20, 25 evaporators out in your store and how far that oil has to go. Also in refrigeration, this is where you really see oil separators more, not so much air conditioning because of the long piping runs, also because of the viscosity of the oil. If you have a freezer system and you're maintaining a zero degree box temperature, you may have a negative 18 degree evaporator. So the oil gets very heavy and thick and can tend to hang out in the evaporator. And so that that doesn't happen, we have this mechanism to get some of the oil right back in the compressor. So it comes in, the vapor refrigerant comes out the top, but then the oil droplets fall to the bottom and you have this orange float valve here, 
When you have liquid, it lifts up the float valve, and then this is under high pressure, and the crankcase is under low pressure, and it pushes the oil back into the crankcase so that you get near almost nothing, but you 90% of the oil out of the refrigerant that has escaped into the discharge line. And then you come over here to your condenser and you condense and you um, have two fans. Now one of the fans is going to start when the compressor starts in this situation. Okay. And then we have the low ambient fan control or fan cycling switch or head pressure control, whatever your favorite name is, that if it's a warmer day, let's say outside and the condenser's outside, the head pressure is going to tend to be higher. So we tap off the discharge line here, and when the head pressure gets kind of high, then we'll need a second condenser fan, and we turn that second condenser fan on, and then uh, as it cools off outside, the head pressure will go down and it opens up and then it runs back again, let's say late at night with the one condenser fan. So we have this fan cycling or uh, low, low ambient fan control that makes on a pressure rise, but it is on the high side. And then we also have a low, a high pressure cutout, which is a safety that if the fans fail and or that you have a very dirty condenser, it's a safety that will open up and kill power to the compressor. Uh, as a safety. Again, we head down the liquid line to the receiver and it stores the refrigerant. It can store all the refrigerant. If you manually front seat this, you'll block off the flow. And then if you ran the compressor, all the refrigerant would be stored over here. And you could change your filter dryer or your sight glass or fix a leak over here or change the CPR valve without having to recover the refrigerant. And then once you made your repair, you would evacuate this portion of the system and then open it back up. And you may not have to add any refrigerant or just a touch. Okay. Also, the fact that on warmer days, we use more of that refrigerant. On colder days, we pile up the liquid in there, which helps to moderate the head pressure a little bit. We come to our liquid line filter dryer. The liquid line filter dryer, purple here, it's doing a couple of things. It's drying the refrigerant and that it actually has the capacity to hold a number of drops of water, you could think. Not that we ever want water or should have water in the system. No, it should be thoroughly evacuated. But if there's any minuscule amounts of water, it'll hold it in here. And the desiccant is a drying agent. Whenever you get new clothes and you see these little packets or medication, you open it up, it says do not eat, and then all of a sudden you have this urge to eat it, even though it makes no sense. Uh, those are desiccants that have a drying effect, but this is full of it. Um, and it also will catch any particulates like tiny, tiny bits of dirt that could have been in the piping or tiny, tiny bits of copper shaving because we don't want to plug up our metering device as it goes through that tiny opening there, okay? We have a sight glass here which does a couple of things for you. It lets you look at the liquid quality. And don't be one of these technicians that say, me add refrigerant till bubbles go away. Bubbles go away, stop adding refrigerant. No, don't make too much of whether the sight glass is clear or not. Uh, yeah, if it's really a lot of bubbles, it may be an indication that it's undercharged. But I have seen systems where I had, one time I had a system where I had a sight glass up here way up on a roof, and then for some odd reason, two stories down, I had another sight glass. This one, the bubbles were swirling like crazy. This one, it was solid as could be with great subcooling. So depending on the location of the sight glass, you may have a few bubbles swirling around in there. Um, it also has this moisture indicator. Here, if you can see the baby W in pink, that would mean wet and green is dry, the dot in the middle of the eyeball, okay? Um, and so this one is showing dry right now. Now, if you had moisture in the system, this would turn pink. And it can be an indication that you may need to change your filter dryer, maybe put all new refrigerant in your system. Okay. Uh, and then we have the liquid line solenoid valve that I'm going to go over here with the pump down. So again, you, you pretty much only have this in some commercial refrigeration systems and what it's there for is to isolate the high and low side, store the refrigerant in the high side, 
and isolate it by having a valve that closes so that you don't have any refrigerant migrating. Because in refrigeration, when the system is at temperature, let's say negative three degrees and the system's off, this is, the evaporator is still at negative three. It's very cold. So hence the pressure's low. So there's a tendency for refrigerant to accumulate in that evaporator. And then it kind of fills up with liquid and it could, when you start the compressor, it could all come, you can get a slug of liquid in there. Okay. Also, it's not a bad idea that if you have a defrost to get the refrigerant out of the piping and just be putting your heat, let's say for electric heating, to melt the ice and not be adding it to the refrigerant necessarily or unnecessarily. Okay, so if the temperature warms up on the thermostat that's in the box um, to zero degrees, this is how the system is going to start now. If you have an automatic pump down system, you energize the liquid line solenoid, it opens up, you're having a high pressure here and your pressure on the low side usually be between five and 10. Okay, maybe around five. And then the refrigerant flows through here and gets over to this pressure control, the low pressure cutout. And when the pressure builds up to like 30, it will kick on the compressor and the compressor will run and the condenser fan will run and it will get cooler. The box is going to get cooler. And then when the temperature of the box gets cold enough, let's say down to negative three or four here, this opens up, kills the liquid line solenoid valve. The compressor keeps running and pumps down, hence the term pump down, the pressure way below normal. And then when we get the pressure down to about five PSI, this opens up, okay? And this opens up and kills power to the compressor and the condenser fan, and it sits off um, there at that cold temperature, and you have very little, just a tiny touch of vapor here in the low side, okay? Um, also, this, if it's set at five, it kind of acts like a low charge control. If you, if you had a big leak or something, and uh, it would not allow the compressor to run also. So it's kind of doing a dual function there as a low pressure cutout, but as an operating control also, okay? So that's the, um, the pump down here. And then again, you come through your thermostatic expansion valve, you go through the distributor, you add the superheat, you come back to the CPR valve, you limit the flow because of the um, CPR valve, you're cutting the maximum pressure. Again, the pressure over here might be um, like 70 or 80 when you're coming out of defrost, but here it's going to limit it to like 50, okay? And again, you'll see here that this is set at 30. You don't want to set your cut in too low because the pressure over here when you go to start the compressor may be quite a bit higher. You know, um, it certainly may is going to be over 100 PSI. And the bigger the difference of the pressure here and here when it starts, and if you have it set at like 6 or 7 or 10 or something, it may stall out the compressor. It may be harder for the compressor to start. So the pressures have to be set um, accordingly. So this is the extra uh, special components that we have here. Now, in the book, in the beginning of the chapter, it talks about EPR valves, which I was debating about to draw or not. Now, an EPR valve is kind of used where you have a system like this, but multiple evaporators. So like in a supermarket, quite typically, you would have another thermostatic expansion valve and another evaporator and another and another and another and another. And you have the ability to control with an EPR valve individual temperatures to exactly what you want. And what it is, is it's a valve right here and it holds back the flow of the refrigerant maintaining, and you can set the pressure in your evaporator or the back pressure by adjusting this on your higher temperature boxes. So, like in medium temperature refrigeration, you may have some things, a lot of things at 40, 40, 38, 37 degrees, like milk cases and yogurt and butter and dairy and eggs and all of this, right? And they may have EPR valves, but then in that same system, and they hold back the refrigerant, but the lowest temperature of all that would be fresh meat. 
Fresh meat we keep around 29 degrees so that it stays fresh as long as possible, looks bright, and usually the greatest health concerns are with like bad meat. So they're keeping it as cold and fresh as possible at 29 and it doesn't freeze because of the salts in the meat. So that one wouldn't have an EPR valve, but the other ones would and you would hold back the pressure maintaining a little bit higher box temperature and this would run free and the pressure here once the box is down to temperature would be the same here with the one without the EPR valve. But you could have a system with 15 or 20 thermostatic expansion valves, evaporators, and EPR valves, okay? And it's the lowest temperature ones like the meat cases that wouldn't have the EPR valve as an overview, okay? Also on defrost, we have two styles of defrost where you are going to pump the system down and then have electric heaters that melts the, the ice. Um, and then you get rid of that condensate, it goes down a drain, and there's a timer that does this about four times a day uh, where you go into defrost and you melt the ice. Because in a freezer, again, even when it's off, your box is like zero or just below zero. So you're gonna be building up ice, especially when that evaporator is running at minus 15, minus 18 degrees, and you're gonna accumulate ice. So you've gotta shut it off every once in a while. You also have 